Okay, as I've um, used my rocker again to go over it, I've put uh, some purple markings. They might be kind of hard to see, but I've marked the places on here where I'm getting some uh, wobbling. Some high. So these are the marked high frets. And then I'm going to check down the neck to see if at the point where I'm catching that is a visibly higher fret from the board up. So if I'm looking down the fret, uh, down the neck at the frets, I can easily see if a fret has a, has a mark, and they don't. So as I'm looking, they all seem to be maybe, no, that's, that's still there. The ones, the ones that are high do seem to still be flush with the neck. So um, beating them with a hammer probably isn't going to fix it. So I'll go ahead and see real quick. I'll beat this guy with a hammer a bit. Okay, and then take my fret rocker. And as I'm seeing here, it doesn't, that's not affecting, uh, that did not affect the wobbliness at all and if, and I knew it I knew it wouldn't but as I look down I can also see that there's no like larger shadow kind of dark space or a visibly lifted part of this fret so it's the top and as I'm looking through each front and back I can see that the frets are essentially as flat to the board as they can possibly be so it's going to need um, it's going to need that work done. Now, of course, two ways I could do it is I can go into this looking at it like um, I'm going to just attack those parts. So then I know it would just be this fret, then this fret, this fret, then this fret, this fret, then this fret. So I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six frets. But if I do that, it might actually end up being more labor intensive because I have to go in here and whittle down this fret until it doesn't rock, then crown it again to match up the rest. And what it'll likely end up doing is giving all the frets around it a more rounded, kind of generic, out of the package uh, crown, and then mine that I worked on will end up having a nice, thin, um, more tailored crown like what I'm going to end up giving it. So again, it wants you to have to do that kind of uh, entire thing. So I'm probably going to do the entire thing. When I do the entire thing, and this again, here we go, pop, best of uh, popular, uh, um, unpopular opinion, opinion, is I might use this. And this is a file that's just as good for frets as if you use one of these and as you can see, you can have a real fun time trying to get the tape off these to put new tape on. And you can get a really un unlevel um, surface if you just put tape over old tape, which I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend doing that. So this is just the most fun sarcasm intended to try to deal with. Because first off, the paper sucks. So when you use this, you're going to get blank spots in the paper really fast. And so it's not going to be doing its work. You can put different grades and grits on it and stuff. That's wonderful. You could have whatever, 320, 220, um, whatever, 600, and even 1,000, and then just run through every grit as you're going over it. That's, you could do that. That's true. You could also use a radius, uh, which a lot of people are going to do. That's cute, you know. But I've never seen anyone say, hey, try one of these. But it's exactly the same thing. It is because because it's longer than any grouping of frets. As you go over the fret, you're going to still be removing that material. So if I just start going over this fret here, I'm not pushing. I'm not pushing this with lots of um, force. I'm not pushing this with force. I'm just going and sliding it back and forth over these frets. And this is actually a pretty uh, strong, you're not going to be wrapping this thing in paper. You're not going to be, it's not going to run out of grit probably ever. 
in the life of the product and I've already removed much of the top of that and if I check it now with my rocker that's done okay so as fast as I just did that as fast as I just did that this is done okay so I'm going to go ahead and just do this really quick over this whole entire thing and just I'm going to flatten where I need to and as I run this over the tops it's going to level out all the frets relatively quickly and I'm not again I can't elaborate this enough I'm not pushing I'm using my hand to glide this across the top of the frets back and forth uh, if you get heavy handed if you get kind of uh, jammy shovey pushy with it then you're just gonna have a lot of fun doing this over and over and over and over again and never getting the results that you want because you're going to be forcing divots and little um, pathways in the frets that you'll that you're not gonna be able to get rid of and this rocking was so light this looks like it's favoring one side of the fret as I'm doing this on this one but that's flat so these the and the uh, rocking was so light that uh, of course it's not going to take the removal of much material and I don't want to remove much material for lots of reasons um, one reason is I like big bulbous chunky high frets like whatever you want to call them jumbo medium or you know because it feels good to me when I'm playing that's what I prefer some people don't like it. some people want their frets to be so close to the fretboard that it's almost like a fretless guitar and you're just pushing down and I guess if you're really heavy-handed and you push with a lot of strength that's good because you're not going to detune or warp the note of the string by pushing really really hard uh, on that on the string but if you learn how to be lighter with your fingers, which I probably am not, but I still don't play heavy, uh, heavy-handed. I don't really, I don't work my strings as I press them. But when I press, I'm not trying to, you know, bed the string down onto the fretboard to where it's strangled down on the fretboard. That's just going to warp and, and twist and uh, mess with your notes. Your, your notes are not going to complete properly. Uh, it's the same effect if you have a nut that's uh, too high, it needs to be cut down. Uh, and when you play down there on the first and second frets and stuff, mostly the first fret, you're going to get a, uh, a bad note, you know, whatever, flat or sharp, whatever note. I, I believe it's flattened out. Um, because you're pushing down so hard that the nut is actually letting the string bend down and, and if the frets are nice chunky high up frets the same exact effect happens uh, on your neck so I like the higher chunkier frets I like how they feel and I like to play on those and so I don't want to lose too much fret material in leveling these frets out now as I'm going over these ones it's really not removing as much of the material so I know and a lot of people from uh, maybe the top five frets you might go one two three four five or you might even go up to seven if you're if you're ready to risk it will intentionally lower these frets a grade and what that does is it just opens up more room for the string to vibrate so there's less chance of it buzzing when you have really low action and when you reach those top five frets, because they've been leveled from their little point up, you're not going to get a problem with uh, string buzz. Or, of course, because as you're getting closer to the bridge, string buzz is eliminated because the frets are, it's running out of frets to allow the string, that as, it's in, as it's vibrating, to touch. So some buzzing is from the nut, some buzzing is from the saddle or the bridge, some buzzing is from the frets, sometimes a combination of all those things. A buzz at the nut is fixed with the nut being uh, properly cut. Uh, the bridge is fixed by making sure you don't have any loose wobbly stuff. Like sometimes the buzzing can come from a threaded whammy bar. A threaded whammy bar will cause 
um, your strings, your whole sound of your guitar to have kind of a buzzy, burry kind of sound going on. And sometimes your buzz is from a um, discrepancy in the footing of the uh, the, the threaded uh, little uh, nuts that hold up the saddle. So if one of those on the saddle here, if one of these little guys that you're going to turn to get this to raise up or down, if it's holding up the saddle, but then its little counterpart on the other side of the saddle is just barely, barely touching or even missing that metal plate, then this little guy can buzz. So you'll want to turn that enough to get it to touch the plate to kind of level out the thing, and that can take care of it. That can actually eliminate a buzz that you're getting from the string. So, fret, or I mean, a buzzing string is not always frets. It's sometimes the nut, sometimes it's a loose nut on your tuning machine, sometimes it's a uh, little riser threaded bolt piece on your saddle, sometimes it's your whammy bar, uh, combinations of all of those things. Uh, can, and also other things can cause it, like maybe some a little bit of loose plastic uh, fitting that's around your pickup might cause um, might cause some buzzing. So just because you're getting buzzing doesn't mean oh I need to go get an entire fret job done and the entire neck needs to be. That's not true, and you'd be wasting your time. You might find out after you get that whole fret job done, the luthier or the guitar tech guy is going to go, oh, well, I did that, but that wasn't the buzzing. The buzzing was here. And he'll show you a nut problem, tuning machine problem, bridge problem. Another thing that can make a lot of noise is the springs in the back of your guitar. Those big springs that are holding up everything uh, in the back can actually buzz. See how that turned out there? Okay, so if I check this again, no, there's no rocking. Well, let me see. No, nope, that's nice and flat. Flat, flat. And of course these frets are flat now, so they might encourage that, that, that I can't really detect so much of a, of, a, of a difference between the heights of the frets or the roundness. Uh, there is no roundness. They're flat. So when you line up your, uh, your little fret rocker to measure them, you remember you're actually, you actually have more surface area uh, for that fret rocker to sit on when you test it. Now this guy seems to maybe want to be slightly higher here. So I'm actually going to lower this right here on purpose Just a tiny, tiny bit and see if that does anything because it is just a tiniest little bit. Yeah. There we go. Now this guy's not, he's not uh, rocking now. Okay. We're going to go look for, now the reason I'm kind of chucky chopping it is because the tops of these frets are no longer smooth. They don't have that smoothness, and so I can't just easily, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard, trying to uh, drag it down to detect those uh, minor differences. Okay, so... Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get a little more done on these guys at the end. Then some people think if you get a flat, um, a flat fret sanding beam, that you're going to hurt your radius. And if you hulk out and jam that thing right in the center and push down, of course you're going to put a flat spot in the middle of your frets, and then it's going to grade up to meet the new flat spot created by your level sanding beam. That's why you don't want to push hard. You don't want to push at all. Uh, but if you very lightly, without pushing that beam, move it around on the frets to level them down, then you're not going to affect uh, you're not going to affect your um, radius at all, because you're going to be following the radius as you bring off the material on the nuts. 
So if you think, well, oh, you need a radius block. You need a radius block to do a radius. Not true. The true purpose of that radius block is to create the original radius in the fretboard when the guitar is being made. So when the guitar is being made, a select piece of wood is chosen there. And um, when they choose that select piece of wood, the top of it is flat. And then they know what radius they want, and so they use that radius beam with sandpaper to create the radius of the top of the neck. Then they beat the frets down onto it to match that. Uh, so they are you're not you're not buying a radius beam for fret work, but you can use a radius beam to match up the radius, and then you know for a fact that you are you are matching the radius as you're sanding with the um, with the frets. The frets are then going to fit the curvature of the neck very well. I think this is good. I'm pretty sure this is really good. I want to go over this again. Just real, maybe just the slightest bit right here. Again, I'm just going to go over this guy just a hair. And I'm not pushing down too much. I'm just saying I want you down just a tiny, tiny bit. Just to get it Hmm. It's gonna be my problem forever here. He's gonna be my my problem child here. I think, I think that's probably good. All right. So now, once you've done that, you want to go ahead and clean off your stuff. And, uh, of course, next I'm going to take this chopper to it. And I'm going to um, mark every top of every fret with this guy. So, and when, when you do this, you don't want to have your right hand and then start here on this side. Why? Because as you're putting the marks on and going this way, you're setting your hand in your pen. So you want to start on the left side if you're using your right hand on the furthermost fret and then give it a line. Then the next fret, give it a line. And notice how I'm moving away. It's the guitar work equivalent of painting yourself into a corner you don't want to do that. So you're going to start on the furthest most fret, then add your marker ink, and then move away from that point so you're not sticking your hand in marker ink and smudging it up or whatever. And this set of marker ink is to reveal the new crown. And so when you lay it down, you will effectively thin this line to a very, very thin little crown point. Um, and the flatter frets kind of uh, by na nature get a wider um, stroke of pen because there's more surface area for the pen to glide across and the frets that didn't get much that were already kind of lower get the, the thinner lighter and when you go over them you'll see that there's very little change in the crown as you're adding it with the uh, file. So it all works out, it all makes sense. But, uh, but yeah you definitely don't want to add from this side and go the other way because you're just going to stick your hand in and uh, be going, you don't want to ink over and then get ink on you. So as I'm getting closer to the end here, there we go. I have added each of these. They look pretty good. I don't see any places that need touches, touch-ups or anything. And I guess I kind of follow the same pattern when I'm uh, doing this. So I'm going to set this here 
and kind of let it go. Um, kind of maybe do this in the camera so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm going to lay this over the top and I'm going to get a feel for the size that I'm dealing with. And as I look in here, I can kind of see that there's width on the edge of the file. And as I look here, I see there's a, a little bit less width. So I'm going to choose which one of these is going to give me the right height. This one I think is a little rounder and more shallow. This one is thinner and sharper with, with more width. So I'll go ahead and uh, try it real quick. I'm going to go and lay this flat and then as I go, like as I feel that, yeah that feels awfully high up. So I think the shallower one might be the one I want to use. You do not want to let the edge of your file start grinding and raking into the wood on the net. But you also don't want to do too much of a like kind of a cowboy rickety hopping motion with it. Now there I've already went over it. There too. I can see that. And it's so close and thin, it's actually getting rid of the line. It might be either that it is a perfect match for the already existing crown, uh, or it could be that it's too flat. So if I go and try this guy and do this, now I can see it's leaving a, a bit of it there. So there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of this entire neck until there are just these tiny little thin lines left. Then, um, I'm, then I'll show the rest. All right, I want to show now. The um, there's that line you achieve, as you can see here in the color. Once you've put a crown back on it, the little lines start to appear, kind of on the center um, of each of the frets. And so after that, I'm going to use my sponge sander again, this time the thicker, kind of drier side here. So I'm going to go over the entire thing, all little marking points or anything, are totally gone. really really nice. There's a little tiny bit on the end still here. Okay, that's gone. So here in the center. Alright, now you can see before I even do too much more here, how soft the edges have gotten. They're rounded and soft, and you can see that the frets are pretty nice. They're actually looking pretty good. So I would use these. Um, uh, this is the, you know, kind of uh, cheap equivalent of uh, some of the guys I've seen that use a block or uh, a piece of bent up like rubber with sandpaper around it, very much like this. It's form-fitting, a good grit, and it's going to go over all of them all at once. I get the stuff off, but I'm getting to the point now where I'm going to want to uh, 
get ready to vacuum this whole thing off too because stuff is going to get stuck in there. It's already pretty smooth feeling though. The whole neck feels nice and, nice and smooth. No jaggies, nothing's hanging, nothing's popping. Okay, I might go ahead and uh, just check it out again real quick. You're not going to do this too much. <laughs> I mean, if you if you check your frets after every little tiny thing that you do, good for you. you that's no big deal. If you uh, if you're checking your frets incessantly, then that's probably not a bad thing. You're probably not going to be making a customer mad. You're not going to make yourself mad when you go and try to deal with your guitar and it. Uh, oh, it sounds good now. Yeah, because. You kept on checking it and making sure that all of the rocking and this there's no there's no rocking now. None. Okay, I'm going over this and uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm going to go to that one real quick, then switch over to my edge. The next step I'm doing, if you do what I'm about to do, um, some people say it's a bad idea, some people say it's the best thing you can do, um, some people uh, use expensive measures and things like that. What I do is um, Attainable. It's something where you're not going to be relying on a store to do this method. This is um, grade zero 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 steel wool. Now, if you do this thing I'm about to do on your guitar with um, the body still on, then you are going to want to mask off the um, the pickups because the magnets on the pickups okay remember those uh, toys you could get when you were a kid and it was like a a face like a guy's face with a red nose and it had a whole bunch of magnet filings in it and then you got a little magnet pen with a little tiny thin magnet on it, and then you could sit there and draw and give them a beard and a mustache and hair and eyebrows and stuff and then when you lifted up the stuff the, the, the metal filings would drop down on it and you could shake it up and all that that's what your pickups are going to do with this. So if you do this with the neck on the guitar, all of these filings are going to land, get sucked up by those uh, pickups. So right now I'm putting the body of that guitar kind of far away from me. I'm going to go ahead and put a pillow or something, a shirt or something over it. So nothing's going to go floating over there and nothing like that. Nothing's going to happen to it now. If it was attached, yeah, I would tape off. I'd put some masking tape over each of the pickups. Also masking tape over the pocket. So that, and you're going to want to mask the pocket in the top of the guitar for any kind. If you're using this guy up here on this end and you've got the body of the guitar near it, you don't want this to hit the body and smudge it or scratch it. You don't want especially this business end to hit the body of the guitar and take big bites out of it. So you want to tape it off and you also want to be careful not to hit it even with the tape on there. So I'm going to use this and go over every fret. As you can see, it's already taken a big dump and you can probably see the, the incredible difference the second this stuff really gets working in there between a fret that has already gotten it and then see this one right next to it there that's one that just got it and that's one that's waiting to get it see the difference this is blinging and shiny almost mirror it's pretty much mirror and this one's still got a kind of a dullness from it so I'm gonna hit this and laboriously liberally just love smush all of it the edges all over the top all around the bottoms this is going to um, 
kind of be the equivalent of that, you know, maybe not expensive, but chemical, nasty kind of uh, um, car metal polish stuff that people might use to get this part of the job done. And um, I actually recommend using this um, steel wool. I think it's great, and I've, I've, it's, this is probably from, maybe from the 80s hair rock universe of uh, guitar maintenance kind of secret world, where uh, they were like, oh, how do you do that? Well, this is how. This, this is what you use. And um, I'm really happy with it. I've always been very, very pleased with the results I got from using steel wool to prepare the frets because it softens so much. It softens the edges so much and it softens and shines and polishes the fret a whole lot. Like it really, really does just really bling the fret. And it also uh, eats up the... Um, you're going to use this. This is going to be gone. There's some of it. So as I'm doing this, this is just grinding away and tearing it away and uh, getting used up. You can go in circular motions a little bit to maybe get some of the edges of the frets, but your up and down motions are what's going to add that kind of finishing pearly kind of kind of shine to it. So I might go like this all the way up and down the thing. Just depends on, it's all by feel. You want to feel with your finger as you're rolling around on the fret what you're supposed to do. A lot of this is by feel. Um, the fret work you might go by feel. Um, I've seen people uh, use a use a fret tool, and uh, because the fret tool was maybe a little shallower than they want the top of the fret, they'll use it sideways. And I've also seen a lot of guys that are, you know, pro guys that work on guitars for 30, 40, 50 years and stuff, just use the fret file straight up and down and just very simply grind it across the top of the fret until it's exactly the way they want it to be. So it's by feel and you don't want to blindly trust what you're doing. You want to feel. <laughs> okay, so um, you, want to, you want to feel what you're doing as you're doing it and make sure you know what you're doing feels kind of like the right thing to do. When I first started working, like I said, the fret erasers, phew, I, I might start using those again because I've seen a lot of extremely good results from them. But when I used them, I was trying to do way too much work with the fret eraser. I wasn't doing the finishing kind of shiny polishing up work before someone might use a car uh, polish. I was using it for a lot of the work that I should have been using um, some sanding sponges or sandpaper stuff to do. So I ate up my fret erasers really, really fast. I still have them, but uh, I'm, I, don't, I, might, I might go back to using them for some of this work. Uh, this right here is filthy, and unless you have a shop vac right next to you like I do, you're going to get this all over yourself and all over everything. And uh, again, like I said, if you do this to the with the body of the guitar still on it, Get ready to have the body of the guitar covered, and any magnetic parts are going to be just kind of, uh, this is going to be stuck to them, <laughs> and it's going to suck, because you'll have to try to get that off there, and then later on you'll be playing your guitar, I've done this, and look down and go, oh crap, my pickup pole has a beard. <laughs> and that's because your pickup pole has uh, picked up and magnetized to a whole bunch of metal shavings from this uh, from the steel wool so you'll have to clean it off no big one but if you use tape you'll still get you'll still see right over each pole a bunch of this metal will get onto that uh, masking tape but then when you take the masking tape off it's it's on that it's not on your guitar so uh, so yeah that helps well, that's really smooth. Really, really, really smooth. I like it. I, I really as sloppy as it ends up being. I can't recommend this enough. It's just, and it's fun and quick. You're not gonna really. Uh, 
it's not hard. This isn't a hard thing. Now fret work is can be kind of hard until you get used to it when you've done a lot of it. My first fret job, I ground those frets down so low that that guitar's next thing forward is either a new neck or new frets or something like that. It's And I was really trying to learn how to work uh, the file to get the frets exactly the way I wanted them. And, uh, you know, kind of like you overdo it. When you're a sculptor, the first sculpture you do is a pile of rocks because you just over sculpted it. You you over sculpted it until the thing just kind of fell apart into a pile. You did, I guess you didn't see it was there. And it wasn't by feel. It was totally by imitating the motions and actions of what I'd learned. And um, and and uh, that guitar plays great right now. The fret job wasn't really bad. It's it doesn't buzz. It sounds wonderful. Um, of course, unless you really hit the thing super, super hard, it's not going to buzz, like most guitars will anyway. Um, but it sounds great, but it does have one fret up here towards the top, where it's slightly low, and I've got to press kind of hard on, only on the, so it was only like on one of these frets, um, like maybe up here, on the fat E, the fret is, oh, just a, like a camel hair, <laughs> too low. And everything else about it, though, ended up really, really good. It's one of my best playing guitars, but I know the frets are, are low. They're, as, they're at the point where they're good, but if I do much more, they're going to be too low. So you want to be careful about that. You definitely don't want to... Uh, well, what I, what I say to my kids, do under don't it. Because they're not. No one's going to listen to you if you say don't overdo it. So you got to confuse their brain into understanding you. So say do under don't it. <laughs> and that'll work out for you. But yeah, this is almost done. And uh, that's the shininess I go for. I'm not going for a, you know, um, sports car rims, mirror polish shine. I, there are no lines, no scratches, no bumps or nastiness, anything like that. These are going to be soft, clean, perfect little frets, happy little frets. Now, the one step I could do after this, but I don't think I even have some of this stuff right now, I'd have to dig through my little back room to see if I still have anything like it, would be to use some automotive metal polish stuff or something, and then put some out over each fret, and then get a paper towel or something, and then really go over it a whole bunch every fret and then it would be one stage shinier than what I'm achieving right now which is a darn near mirror this is almost a mirror shine as you can see anyway if I can let that kind of focus there and you can see the edges of the frets have been very much rounded now there are no sharp edges and in my opinion that's what you want to go for. You want to get that where none of them, I'll go ahead and go ahead and just uh, tease and sass up the side of it here. This is extremely effective uh, for fret work. The quad aught four zeros, four aught steel wool, not too expensive. You can get it at places, maybe a um, woodworking hardware, Menards, uh, off or whatever shops have this stuff for whatever other zillions of things you might use it for. So I guess some places you can't get it. Wow. That's very nice. Okay, right on the edges. Looking here. And I'm just letting the shine tell me if there's anything going on anywhere. To get the edges, you might go over the wood. And then you'll find that the, uh, the a bit of the... Um, steel wool that you're using is actually pushing up against the edges of the fret 
to soften that. See here, this guy looks just a little bit more. Yeah, that's blinging now. When I'm done, uh, I'll get this bag that I keep my kind of used ones in, and I'll go ahead and reuse these later until they kind of vanish and are gone. Okay, so now I've got my um, chop back. <laughs> This is kind of oh yeah, very soft, rounded, clean, polished. So next step, I put this on the body to decide where the holes are going to go. Break out my drill and put this on. So now I'm putting the uh, tuning machines. And these are taken off of a um, F and guitar, I think. I have several of them. They're cheaper, but they're not too awful. Eventually, I'm going to put either locking tuning machines or just overall better, maybe even Fender tuning machines on this or a Grover tune or something awesome. Uh, but for now, I'm going to put these on there to test it. Before I do the neck pocket, I'm going to put the tuning machines on, set the neck in the pocket as tight as it can go, then I'm going to put two strings on the guitar and then line them up with the neck through the nut and lightly, ever so lightly, just kind of... Uh, 
check them on the nut to make sure everything lines up as the neck is. Because you don't want to, obviously you don't want to do all that work to set the neck up and then the strings not be aligned. So to set these uh, tuning machines up, I'm putting them on, tightening down the little nut part that uh, guides along the edge of the, of the tuning machine pole here and then tighten them just enough to where you have a tiny bit of give on each of them and uh, uh, before you decide exactly where you're going to go ahead and mark for your uh, drilling. When I drill, sometimes I, I this sounds kind of maybe barbaric or dumb, but I'll just hold the drill bit in my hands and my fingers and then just turn and create a starting hole. I might drill after that but I'll use my fingers. I'll just use my fingers for that and uh, it's pretty easy. So I put all these on. There's no screw holes in it yet. It hasn't been uh, measured out and it looks like it's pretty close but you don't want it to be in perfect. One way to really check though is to make sure every edge of the tuning holding uh, uh, keys, the tuning key parts, are lined up perfectly with the edge of the headstock. So that's the, one of the first indicators. And then when you look on the other side, of course, you want to make sure that uh, none of these points where the screw is going to go in are off. So you can get a straight edge and line it up against each of these. And you'll see if one is a little high or one is a little low. So it's a trade-off between the two. You're going to set a straight edge down, check uh, to make sure these are all in, in perfect line, and then flip it over and check and make sure each of the tuning keys has the right little level clearance against the edge of the top of the headstock. And when that's done, I will um, probably get a pencil or even just the tip of the, of the um, bit and kind of give it a little push into each of those holes. And if you want, just to be nice and careful, you can tighten down on these when they're right at that exact point where you know you want them give that a little bit more of a turn just so there's no way it will uh, shift around or move then go in and get either, each of those um, and then you'll want to put obviously put the screws in to set that and then after I've done that and fitted the neck in there and put the strings in and lined them up make sure the strings are lined up with the nut and the bridge then I will go ahead and uh, use probably a bit or something through the back of the body to decide where the hole placement's going to be on the neck. Alright, so now I'm uh, going, I've went ahead and uh, dotted each of these areas where the uh, screw hole is going to be for the tuning machines and I used a marker a little bit there uh, one's already ready and I'm still not using the electrical stuff yet. I'm using this uh, screwdriver and I'm going to just line it right up here with that hole, give it a couple turns. What I did do though is, um, I'll show in a second, a um, tape. Got some blue masking tape and I went ahead and put it around the bit at the near depth of the screw uh, to protect it, so of course I'm not going to go crazy and get this through the other end of the uh, headstock, which would be really bad. If I put a uh, piece of tape on there, and here's two of them. And before I put the dot, I put the tiniest little punch of drill bit on it, so that it has a little tiny, tiny bit of a grab there. Uh, to make it a little less likely for me to slip around and stuff and, uh, and mess up that uh, first screw hole. And I'm doing this uh, just for a couple reasons. It's easy and fast and when I go to use that drill it's going to be to set the um, it's going to be primarily to set the holes for the neck and get the screws in there for that and uh, it's going to be quick so I'm not going to be in too big of a hurry. I might use to go ahead and use the drill to put the uh, screw bolt parts 
in the back of the neck to set it down, but I don't know yet. I might also just use a screwdriver because that's just easy and it's not hurting me any <laughs> to do a little bit of physical labor there. So that's four of those. Fifth one, trying to line it just right. I get started and then I'll check it again real quick just to make sure I'm not missing that pathway because of some of the uh, sawdust that came up from the uh, initial hole. But yeah, just using a screwdriver and a drill bit instead of my drill. And uh, sure, it works fine. When I install the tuning machines, I'm going to use uh, the same screwdriver and a little screw bit there to uh, finalize that to get them in there all the way. And as I said a few minutes ago, then I will go ahead and seat the neck in the neck pocket and then uh, test out two semi-loose strings up the neck with uh, into the grooves of the uh, nut just to make absolutely sure that what we're dealing with here is strings that will line up from the bridge all the way up uh, to the nut. Because, you know, the worst thing would be to put make holes for the neck to be uh, bolted on at the body, at the pocket, the neck pocket, and then once you get the neck bolted on, then the strings are way, way crazy up high uh, or too low uh, as they approach the nut. So, you definitely don't want that. And I guess this might endorse uh, do-it-yourselfers um, that you don't need to have power tools doing every little tiny aspect of everything that you do. Of course, if you're in a zip-zap factory, you're, you're going to be <laughs> and be so used to it that you'll just be running through these uh, very, very quickly. All right, so I went ahead and put the uh, tuning machines back on. I'm kind of lining them up here. I've only got the nut uh, tightened enough to help hold it into place slightly and I've got my bit and my screws there we go screws in there and uh, hopefully that'll work probably in. okay there we go and there's a little bit of bite there now um, I have seen two guys recently, um, one of them was Wilkinson himself, and they're telling you you need to use this stuff uh, on all of your screws. All your screws that are going into wood, use, and it's, it's like petroleum, it's chapstick, it's like petroleum chapstick kind of stuff. That you're going to put in there and I guess that will help all kinds of it will help with uh, wood chipping fraying it will help to guide the threading in it's and you know they're selling you chapstick so I guess Wil Wilkinson might be a chapstick salesman because I've never seen any of that before um, of course I never looked for it and I never thought oh maybe someone's putting some kind of petroleum thing in each of these holes as they're putting it in and if it does serve a purpose which I'm sure maybe it does do something I really don't think it's that necessary I don't think it's if you don't put chapstick on your screws it's gonna hurt anything so you know the guys like a uh, Bert B's chapstick salesman right now while he's building these kits and I you know he's great his stuff's great well and this was you know the Wilkinson mach tuning machine Wilkinson Bridges, Wilkinson pickups, uh, they're all really great, especially the bridges. I think the Wilkinson bridges are some of the best ones out there, especially for the price. And uh, they have the Wilkinson 
Stumac guitar kits now, and he showed how to build a um, you know complete Wilkinson Stumac guitar kit. And uh, every screw he put in, he said, now also remember, and I think he called it, what, like a slick stick or something like that. It was a, or something like that. It was a chapstick that you're putting on every single screw, everything. It doesn't, doesn't matter. If it's a screw, every screw that went into the uh, pit, plate, the pit guard scratch plate thing, every screw that went into the tuning machine, every anything that would where threading was going in first the screw was going to be slathered in this chapstick stuff and I don't have that, I didn't buy it, I probably am never I don't know, if you want I can get uh, some chapstick and then pretend like that did something when I put screws or bolts or something in my guitar but for now I'm not going to put chapstick or petroleum product stuff. I, you know, like I said, I'm sure it does something, and I'm pretty sure uh, the majority of instruments are not going to have that. I don't know. I will, maybe I should watch the Fender um, build videos or Gibson build videos, and I'll see where they are using some kind of chapstick on all of the screws in their guitar, and I'll. You can prove me wrong and go, oh, you got to use this uh, whatever kind of petroleum jelly chapstick looking stuff on every single threaded thing that's going into the guitar. But until I see that, I'm probably not going to go for it. And there's that. It's looking pretty good. Pretty sure they're all even. They look good. Uh, one way you can test them, I guess, is get... Uh, just get your straight edge. See, that glides right along the tops of each of those. You can get a ruler. Uh, this is the sanding edge that lines right up with them. That's good I guess. Um, you can also eye it and just make sure that the tops of these, and, and you know here's the, the main goal here is that the tuning peg key thing, or the key I mean, the tuning key is coming up evenly over this and so when you turn it it's being turned evenly as I look at them they all look like they are even with the top of the headstock and that's the important thing with it so I think it looks pretty good yep I don't think I went too crazy wonky with any of those maybe maybe this bottom one's a little wonky I don't know I don't think so I think it's okay. So there's those. And of course I've got the body here. I had a little chip when I was testing this. A tiny, tiniest little bit chipped out. So this I'm going to get some fingernail polish or white out or something and just kind of fill that in before the final assembly. And that's going to be nothing. And that was my fault for cheap guitar. And then that's so tight of a fit that is really just... What I did was I got a knife and I scraped and cut away around this uh, poorly cut edge of the, pit, of the pit guard. Actually, they say this is... they call this a pit guard. And I think when the people call it a scratch plate, that's a little more accurate because what I've heard, um, at least one, but probably a couple of luthiers and uh, guitar techs that I have a lot of respect for and have learned a lot from say is that your pick is never scratching this. This is not guarding the guitar from the pick. It's your fingers. Your fingernails are what's scratching this when you play. So this is actually a finger guard or a scratch plate. But we of course we call it a pick guard erroneously and then that's stuck and so if you look up pick guards you're going to see more of these than if you are you know possibly a little more uh, correct calling it a scratch plate, less are going to pop up. And if you call it a finger guard, no one's going to even know what you're talking about. But what does it really do is it guards it from your fingers. And what's really scratching it, this fingernails, the tips of your fingers and stuff are scratching this, not the pick. I don't, unless you've got some weird picking style where you're going down into the body of the guitar with every stroke of your pick, this is not being scratched up by your pick. It's actually being scratched up by your fingernails.
that's in there, and I mean I can just tell there is there is no motion at all for that to move. It's flush with the bottom. There's a tiny bit of an edge here, but I think that's an unevenness. Um, as I'm looking here, it's even, and as I flip it over, it is essentially even. But I want it. I I feel like I want it to go a little closer. This a little more this way. So we're going to have to check that out. That's why you put strings on it and do this next step because you go ahead and waste your time uh, set, setting the place uh, holders for these holes, drilling the holes, and then putting in your bolts without this little string test and then oh boy the mess up. And of course your holes are going to be so close to where they need to be later only like dowel rod, glue, uh, sanding, and then re-drilling is going to be good enough to fix that problem. So you don't, I definitely don't want to have to go through that. I don't want to have to put dowel rods in this neck. I don't want to have to glue the dowel rods and put them in there and then sand it down flat and then re-drill holes because I messed that one little part up. Of course, one thing uh, I guess you could do is just take a string and then line it up right with where you know it's coming from the saddle and then line it up yourself with the nut. Uh, that's the same thing. You know, it's pretty much exactly the same thing as what I'm going to do. So those are the ways though you, you can check it. You would also, um, I guess you don't even need to use a guitar string. You could use a piece of string. You could use a uh, fishing line or uh, whatever, thick Indian human hair, whatever. Whatever you want to get that's going <laughs> to that's going to show a straight line from the top of this saddle to your nut over here, which is a little off camera here. Uh, from here to here, which now that's off camera. It was kind of right there. From here all the way to here and shows that you're getting a perfectly straight line. And then of course you want to go to your high, your high E and then up to your low E and then try both of those out and just verify that they're lined up perfectly straight with your bridge then you know your neck is in the pocket where it needs to be let's hope that this works out alright so now I've got this set up and as I'm looking at it the neck seated down uh, they're both uh, getting to the neck right where they're supposed to and there's pretty good even spacing, but I've noticed that it, they're thin. Um, it thins out quite a bit before it reaches that nut. Now adjusting the bridge can raise or lower along the, uh, um, of course, along the um, raising and lowering uh, the saddles, I mean and changing their little angle can add the needed like there. So now this guy looks pretty good even though I would think maybe as it approaches the nut here it's getting awfully close but I think that's really how they are. I think that's uh, more of an aspect of some of the Fender guitars. So there's a lot of um, space though the closer it gets to the nut. This nut seems to really kind of draw in the strings before it gets to the headstock and I really think that that is a often a condition um, of this type of neck and type of nut it's more of kind of a vintage look but I think as I'm looking at it this is pocketed as tight and as close as it can get there's no sway there's no wiggle room or anything like that and I think it's looking pretty good. There's this basically virtually identical spacing at the first fret and before it reaches the nut. And then as it comes up, it's close to identical spacing. Of course, this is slid down a little. If I go ahead and raise the saddle for the high E string here a little bit, then it starts to match very closely. So I think we're good. I think this is um, 
this is a good setup for this neck. All right. So next, I'm going to carefully flip this over, make sure it's still seated where I want it to be. I think I'm going to chop uh, the strings a little. And I'm, I'm not taking them off. I, it might seem a little bit crazy. But I'm going to go ahead and leave those on. They're not obviously not tuned up because the pressure of tuning them up would draw this neck up out of the pocket so that I couldn't do this. But they're not hurting anything being there. If I flip it, over, flip it over, it's not going to hurt anything for it to be on there. Um, I've noticed that it looks like it's been cut for tens or maybe bigger on the high E. And I'm not displeased with that because there's going to be no pinch at all. Now, I guess there might be... Um, and also I noticed that there, the nut looks like it could at the low E stand for some slight filing but on the high E that nut is right there it's like I want to say it's almost like a piece of paper maybe not it might even be touching so I really hope this nut isn't already cut too low at the high E because if this is touching on that that I don't hear it though and even low and once it's tightened up the distance is going to pull it up over it. So it could just be that the high E is just absolutely perfectly filed already um, here. And then the low E needs to be filed slightly. Because it's if you look and check, I'm pushing down on my third fret. And then I'm pushing down here just to see how much space the nut is allowing for the string. And you want that to be probably closer. Just slightly closer though. Um, and and uh, and very slightly closer. Now for this file job here, I could forego using a file and really just pull this off here like that and go in here with a little piece of this same gauge of string and because it's this like round wound kind of rigid, uh, it's almost like a little saw blade, I could just very carefully easily work a tiny bit of extra depth on there because that's not in there all the way. So it looks, it's weird, it looks like the the high E was definitely cut for at least a 10, but it looks like the low E was cut for something much smaller than a um, 47, or 46 I mean, because this would be a 46 gauge string. So the low E it nut, and then as it goes down, it looks like the nuts are filed. Um, it looks like this nut's been filed pretty well. I think that whoever did this did a pretty good job with this nut. Of course, there's absolutely there's not tension on here to test it. But as I'm looking at it, the height of the saddles are already creating a pretty low and uh, stable action as it's tightened up. And we get some relief in the neck that's a natural effect there because it's a flat neck. It's going to should get the just about perfect amount of relief from string tension once it's bolted to the body. So once these are up, we might have some higher action and I might be bringing down these saddles. And of course, like I said much earlier in the video, if the saddles get too low, you get little pokey things sticking up out of it, you know you need to shim the neck. So I may need to shim this neck, but I don't think so. I think that because this is um, giving me even just the slightest bit higher field for the strings to touch, then it's not going to be necessary. But I'm really liking how this neck looks now. It's, uh, it's impressive.